Hello, everyone. I am here with two amazing, amazing researchers, digital experience architects, CX visionaries. But you know what? More importantly, I am here with two people who know how to put in the work. And so I'm super excited to be joined by Jess and Haley from Scott's Miracle Grow. Um, should we just go ahead and jump right into it? Should we just go have some fun? Let's do it. Okay, I love it. I love it. Um, I, first, I want to get into it. Tell me about yourselves. Like, what's your background? What's your role at Scott's Miracle Grow? What got you from like those first jobs, the job where you're at right now, and, and what do you do? Yeah, I'll I'll kick it off. I am coming up on my six year anniversary at nice. Scott's. Um, sort of started out pre COVID, going into the office every day, but. Um, yeah, it's been a really, really interesting journey. My background is a lot of user experience, um, more on the evaluative usability research side, but also okay. information architecture, design. Um, and I had some really, really amazing experiences early in my career, um, working in the consulting space, um, working for big uh, in-house organizations. And I think I really found a love for being able to be in-house and see the work mm. all the way through um, <laughs> and to see I, I what so some of that. That. <laughs> and well, and to see some of these really long timelines all the way through too. And yeah. we have several projects that we've been working on that span multiple years. And yes. it's such a blessing to be able to see that as opposed to having to, you know, fall away after a little bit and hopefully come back. But um, it's been really great. And I've been able to um, bring on amazing people like Haley who have made us just even better. I'll toss it to you. Love that. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I've been at the company for, I just hit my five year in May. Um, so I kind of owe my entire UX career to Jess. Um, <laughs> UX is where I, I started UX at Scott's um, and I've kind of been here ever since. Um, leading and building um, some sort of a team here so that we can kind of build empathy across the organization with how our consumers wow. use our digital products, use our physical products, et cetera. Um, so excited to be here and chat a little bit more. I love that you just said that you're building empathy across the organization for how people use your digital product. Like, I love that statement. I kind of <laughs> want to turn it into a t-shirt, so I'm not going to lie <laughs> if you somehow see that pop up someplace. Just make sure you send me one. Just send me Yeah, one. I'm just going to send you one. There'll be like a whole, like, we'll Venmo each other. It's going to be fine. Okay, <laughs> so let's talk just a little bit about kind of what's going on and what are some of the big projects? What are some of the big initiatives? When you start to think about experience, and especially when you start to think about digital experience, where are some of the directions and where are some of the key areas that not only you want to see the organization start to go in, but what are some of those big projects that you guys are working on right now? that you can share. I don't want to give away the secret sauce, but some good stuff. Yeah, I think a, a big thing for us is um, really honing in on education across all Ooh. of our digital platforms. We need to kind of educate our consumers about what they need to do in their lawns, what they need to do in their gardens, so that they feel kind of confident and comfortable tackling these projects. And the more confident and comfortable that they feel, the higher likelihood that they're gonna purchase from us, or that they're gonna revisit our sites, um, come back and learn more. And so I think that's, that's always been a big push for us. And I think we just continue to find and drive ways to um, really push education, push all of the tips and tricks so we can teach you how to be the best gardener and gardener that you can. I love that. I love, but that really brings up kind of a very specific need of being able to identify fairly well ahead of time. I would think that kind of earlier in the content and the experience development process, what the burning needs of education are like what are those things that are top of mind what are those things that people want to talk about like you know like me I, like i want to talk about how, how to make the fat squirrel in my yard go on a diet like i don't want him to stop eating but like right but so when we everyone has a different place that they want to start learning so what are some of the things what are the tools the techniques that you guys are using to really not only get an understanding of that what maybe a little ahead of time but then also mapping and understanding if that's really what your audience wanted to experience like is it like i might sound it's i think it's cool but i might also be navel gazing 
<laughs> yeah, I think we're always looking at bringing a lot of cross-functional input together. So I know amazing. folks on our team, even just last week, had this really amazing conversation with our sales, our field sales team, to understand like, hey, when you run into folks, that when they're in the aisle of a garden center, you know, what are the questions that they're typically asking you and how mm. can we create a bridge for them? Um, we have folks on the team that focus really deeply on weather and the impacts of weather on our category and people shopping and trying to just participate in our category overall. And so how do they see weather trends impacting us and what are some solutions that we can create um, there? Um, Haley is highly involved and runs all of our conversion rate optimization and A-B testing. And so we're able to get some really clear answers on like what kind of content is performing better and driving some of those key actions. Um, we're focusing on SEO. What are people searching mm. for? And what are the terms that we're looking at? So we really do try to bring a lot of different sources together to get at what are the burning questions that people have? And also how can we help meet them in the middle? You know, we don't want to come yeah. in and be, you know, we are the expert and we know all well, but, overlords. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, so your problem, could your tomatoes be more, could you have a bigger bounty or a bigger harvest? Yeah. Maybe that squirrel, that squirrel is your big problem right now. Right. And so we can solve that one for you and make it more likely that you're going to put in another, um, you know, another seedling next year, maybe two seedlings next year, because yeah. you, you really want to make it happen. Um, then that's a success for us. I love that. I love that. You know, listen, as a uh, long-term marketer, I feel like I should say recovering marketer. I think that's a recovering <laughs> marketer and, you know, been at agencies, uh, you know, it worked very closely with, you know, art departments. And I've been through that process of, right, like you, you're you like, oh, I got to build a website and I'm going to go and do this and it's going to be amazing. And here, here's my, you know, here's my mood board and here's all of my, like, you know, here's my site maps and here's all of my research, all this. And then you go and build it and you kind of forget that all of that research, all of that information that you poured your blood, sweat and tears in, even if you were looking at all the SEO research to make sure all of that foundational search was there, um, you, you kind of forget that the testing is to keep going, you know, that, that you kind of have to constantly be working on that care and feeding. I know that you guys do a lot with user testing. So I'm curious, can you share some of the examples of how you're using these testing tools, right? Um, whether it is something like SEO, whether it is that research on the back end, whether it is A-B testing, or whether it is these qualitative panels, can you share a little bit about what you're doing and then where that starts to slot in when you start to think about kind of the life cycle of engagement for each of your brands. Yeah, user testing has been a great partner for us, I think for the past three, four years at this point. Um, we use them in every way that we possibly can. So um, we do a lot of like post-launch, we do a lot of pre-launch usability. Yeah. We'll do some like moderated interviews where we're getting really in depth and nitty gritty about how people are kind of shopping that aisle and what their triggers are for them to go out in their yard, their yards and gardens. Um, I think most recently um, we, we recently ran a study on um, a new uh, kind of platform that we're looking at going out with and wanting to get some pre-launch research with it to understand mm. what are the pain points that they're having or what can we expect once we once we release this or what are some hypothesis that we can pull from this and then now we can take those and go in and do testing post-launch so now we mm. can say hey we're lacking education here how can we then tackle that post-launch and come up with some te different testing ideas and different designs where we can really pull and show that quant data of, mm. hey, we saw this in qual, These are this is what we heard from our consumers, and then now we can test against it and say, okay, hey, these two variations smashed it. We really got the consumers what they needed from these lenses. And so uh, we use user testing a lot when it comes to triangulation and starting yeah. there to find like our big common themes amongst our participants. And then going out, talking to our analytics team or doing A-B testing to really marry that quant and that qual together um, so we can come up and with the best insights we can. I, I love that. I'm, I'm going to ask like a, 
Okay. Cause you said something and now my brain went someplace. And so that's where <laughs> the question's going to go. But I think part of the problem a lot of times, or at least I, I mean, I can remember being at those tables and it, sometimes it can feel like the, you know, those data kids came in and told me my baby was ugly. I don't want to listen to them anymore. Right? Like it feels like that sometimes. What are some of the things that you guys do like really to champion the real voice of the customer by triangulating this quant in the qual, you guys really are sitting at a very interesting intersection of where that true customer user reaction is coming in. It's not you saying, well, I think people didn't like this button. It's literally someone being like, I hated that button. You're like, whoa, like there's, the, and but then you also get the reason behind that. You get the richness behind that. Mm -hmm. How, you know, how are you guys finding the insights and the information that you're sharing and triangulating move like upstream so that it's not just I didn't like that button, but that it becomes really rich insight for even senior executives in business strategy to say, maybe we need to make a different decision because if, if education is pushing us here, maybe our product has to shift there too, or maybe this is a different opportunity. Are you seeing what you guys do take a different stream than kind of just sitting in that digital optimization space? Yeah, I, I think there's a few ways that we're seeing that happen. We, we have a team that is really um, like respectful, I guess, of data and not a yeah. lot of defensiveness at all. And so I don't know, we're very lucky, I think, but we've not really had a situation where it's like, well, you're just saying that because you don't like it or that's your purple. You don't like purple, yeah. Um, you know, the power of a highlight reel, right? The power of video, the power of having a video of eight people uh, saying, I'm confused. I'm not sure what like the, the cycle on that would be, or I'm confused. I don't know how I would use that. It can't, you can't really rebut that at all. Yeah. <laughs> and so we have teams that are really, really oriented to improving and optimizing and being willing to be wrong and work in a really agile way of if you know if we can optimize if we can improve and it's also the beauty of working in the digital space is that yeah. we are working on products that are constantly evolving um much of the the physical products that we sell in stores and that we sell online um you know they're always evolving too that time scale is a little bit longer but our innovation pipeline is super rich and we're really trying to just sort of help folks that maybe are a little bit more used to that longer time frame to say hey you know when it comes to um the digital experiences that we have we're doing that same you know product life cycle we're just sort of squeezing yeah. it down a little bit um, and the R and D that you're doing to make sure that that product is super, super effective and that it really does deliver on all of the promises. That's essentially what we're doing too. Um, just applied yeah, to a different, that. yeah. I love I'll, that. Just I'll emphasize one of your points there too, of like highlight reels. We have shown that that like sticks yeah. with our stakeholders the most, like there's nothing more important. And I think this is really how we've help to like build empathy here is like, let's put this in front of user. Like, we watch videos all day. So let's put this in front of our stakeholders, in front of our cross-functional teammates and truly show them what these consumers and these participants are doing yeah. so that they really have a chance to like put their, put their feet in their shoes and understand how they're experiencing it rather than us just saying, Hey, the, the button's ugly. Like you can yeah. actually truly hear it. And it really does drive us and take us really far with our stakeholders. Oh. So. That's amazing. That's amazing. You know, and I, I think that it's so interesting in your business. I mean, so Scott's Miracle Grow, I think everyone thinks about it from a different entry point, right? Because the portfolio of brands is really expansive across the company. So you have a different mindset of buyer, you have a different skill level of buyer, you you know, like you got me like self professed urban farmer here in Los Angeles growing a <laughs> tomato, I'm pretty proud of myself. But then you have like farmer farmers, like you guys have this really broad group of customers. But you also I would imagine that also translates into a very broad group of stakeholders internally, some of whom are looking for that transaction, right? Like, I need someone to buy that bag of soil. I need someone to be referred to a channel partner. Like mm -hmm. it's going to be very transactional. And Haley, like you mentioned, you also have that stakeholder that's like, no, no, no. Remember the education part. Like remember how we lead people into the funnel. So those can often be in most organizations, a pretty significant push and pull. 
-hmm. when you're trying to figure out how to prioritize, whether it's testing, whether it's research, how quickly things get up. I think traditionally in the world of research, you got to make choices because things take a while. Can you kind of walk me through how you've developed best practices, whether it is how you prioritize the speed and scale at which you're able to work, but then also how have you really been able to just kind of, I guess, balance, like balance everything. So now that you have the knowledge, how do you, you know, how are you able to then kind of make sure that like, yeah, we're getting bags and carts, but we're also getting people to think about the next season. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, focusing on building confidence and motivation uh, and having content that can get people excited to mm -hmm. maybe um, start caring about their lawn for the first time in a while or to take that very first step, that kind of upper funnel, I guess, like that kind of getting people to just start to care about something that maybe they've lost interest in or they started a garden during covid and they you know maybe had one or two seasons of like oh boy but yeah. putting them back in um you know if we can do that then the rest of the pieces are much easier for a lot of our other partners that are in media and marketing and sales like mm. we've we've really primed them to say like you can hit a home run now <laughs> like we've got folks in that right mindset and so i think having that focus being on the upper funnel it, it we see that it's paying it for things that mm. come later down the road um and that that is the right place for the channels that we're focused on most often that's the right role for it to play. I think that it can sometimes vary by brand and there are certain, in the portfolio that we have, there are certain brands that say, we are exclusively here for education. If you wanna compare products because you're mm. maybe between two or three that have a similar benefit, that's why we're showing up for you in the digital space. Or if you want to get inspired to take on a new project, that's why we're there. There are other brands and other sub brands where we see that purchase and that conversion being their top focus. And so we are having to shift a little bit to say, hey, you know, you're really focused on moving people through the purchase path, getting that cart to move into checkout, getting that checkout to move into a purchase. And so we do have to balance a little bit. And sometimes certain voices are louder <laughs> than others when yeah. it comes to making that yeah. balance. <laughs> we're, we're a small team. And so we have mm. to be choiceful and pretty strategic on, on how we take those on. Um, but I think truly in the last couple of years where we've tried to create efficiency in our MarTech stack and creating efficiencies with the platforms and tools that we're using, we're able to take an insight and apply it more broadly, a little bit easier mm. than we have in the past. And so that rising tide can then benefit all of the brands in the ways where it's appropriate to benefit all of the brands. And then note those that need like a more specific focus or a more specific um, outcome, we can focus our attention really deeply there while we've also brought everybody up to that same sort of baseline experience that we're yeah. able to identify. Love that. How important is speed when you start thinking about these tests and when you start thinking about kind of how quickly you're able to like, let's look, okay, let's be honest. I remember back in the day, this is, this is going to prove like how old I am as a marketer. Um, I worked in, you know, skincare and I also worked in professional sports and I can remember like, remember good old like focus groups, right? Where you were like, let me get 20 people to sit over there in uncomfortable chairs with <laughs> bad apple juice and maybe some of the butter cookies that came out of the tin like <laughs> Jess you come on like we remember this where you're like oh yeah I remember six, six, eight wildly expensive. projects wildly expensive. yeah I was can on you both find sides the of the glass <laughs> right yeah like can you can you no 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 find the button no 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 find not the real button no you're not your yeah. shirt button like we remember those days right like I still have pain from those days so how important is it now in this digital space well we are expected to move so quickly right? Everyone's like, well, what do you mean you can't just change it? Well, what do you mean? How important is speed and scale? Does one come before? Like, is it more? How do you start to look at those things? Yeah, I think not to kind of 
poke at user testing again here, but I think user testing super much helps us with that, where mm -hmm. um, our, a, our ability to test early and often and uh, through the user testing platform, I think has been super helpful for us. Um, I know we have stats somewhere in our case study of just like, we've been able to grow exponentially and pull a lot of those consumer insights in much easier and much quicker because we can test much faster. And I think that also just speaks to our, our consumer where we are not that like niche, very, very tiny, tiny business that has that very niche consumer. We want to talk to homeowners. We want to talk to those who are in their lawns and gardens. And so it's a little bit easier for us to then recruit for those folks to be able to bring them in. Um, so our definitely our speed to insights has definitely increased. I know I can't speak to some of those kind of long days in a um, in a focus group room, but they in the fun. new age, I'm they so weren't fun, Haley. You don't want to. You don't ever want to. Mm. I went to one. I went to one in my lifetime with Jess, and I will say we we work we work much more efficiently and faster now. So I, I did one on sunscreen, and it's like a day and a half. I don't get back in my life. I'm just I'm just saying. Like it, just, it was not good. It was not good. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, you know. My, the, there's two questions I want to leave us here um, and, and share with our audience because I love these best practices and I love the things that you guys are sharing. And I think that these are, I mean, I, you guys look at UX, you guys look at the digital experience, you look at this, but I think that so much of this can be actually applied even in when we think about decision making for executives and the velocity and the speed at which we need to make decisions about our businesses. We need to be able to bring in all the data, bring in all the information and to bring in that empathy, like you guys said. Like I love thinking about how you can apply that for a, a business leader and an executive trying to move that concept of decision velocity forward. What are some of the things that you guys have noticed really make that difference? Like, are there any things that you would share with your colleagues and your peers across the CX ecosystem of if you could take this into your leaders, three rungs up, you know, at the very top of the org, yeah. these are the types of things that we can and should be delivering specifically to accelerate decision making. Anything that you guys would share? Yeah, I think you talked about speed and having that speed. We are obviously in a very seasonal business, right? Spring is our Christmas so of a lot of other <laughs> CPG and uh, like online retail, like the holidays are that's our spring. And I love it. Um, having an answer in spring for spring to impact spring is really important and so yeah. that contrast from the olden days to now where Haley has and can turn a study around in 24 hours essentially and i think that's where too i can take a very specific question that an executive has a very specific or nuanced uh hypothesis that someone in leadership has and we can run it we can answer it and we can get that insight back to them to inform mm -hmm. it pretty quick um some of the things that we often are doing in the middle of that process though are sort of helping them massage their hypothesis too of like well you know i think that people don't care about weather and how it impacts their seeding project their grass seed project um you know and so we're saying well is it really about weather or is it about temperature or maybe mm. they're nervous about how long it's going to take to see results or whether they have to water that much and so we're trying to help understand sort of the boundaries of the question that we're trying to solve or identify at least like the rough shape of the hypothesis maybe that somebody has and then we can come at it really iteratively and say we asked that question, here's the response that we got. And we can ask two, three more questions too, to say, okay. well, actually, hey, you know, they talked mostly about watering. Watering was their real concern. And so we can then spin it into another, spin it into another. Yeah. Um, there's a great way, I think, that we can help inform some of those leadership decisions that they're having to make, um, which are often so, so quick um, in a, a way that we probably couldn't before. I love that. That's that, I love that. And so, but then this leads to my next, like almost second to last question. I'm going to count this as a B to that last question I asked. Okay, just be honest. It's just between us girls. I mean, no one else is going to see this. No one else is going to see this. Has the results of that, has the, the, the ability to bring that research and that insight so quickly also kind of 
opened the floodgates though for folks across the organization to be like i too would like you to test this where now all of a sudden everyone's like i would like you to test blue versus dark blue and you're like that might not be a priority today oh yeah it's ironic that you bring that up because we just had an example of that this week where like we are so dying to kind of get our research in front of people to share what we're finding and the insights that we have and build that empathy but once you share it, like it's not gonna stop flooding in. And so I think we're right now trying to trying to figure out that balance a little bit too of, and that's where like priority comes in and seasonality, especially for us comes yeah. into play of how do we best balance these things within given seasons and within given priorities? Cause we wanna help everyone. We wanna bring all the insights and build as much empathy as we possibly can, I but know. it definitely comes with, uh, comes with the flood is coming in and we got all the intake requests as possible. So everybody wants a new question. Okay. Okay. So most important question I'm going to ask for you guys to share with our audience, like most important question, what should we be growing? Tomatoes, cucumbers, like what, like zucchini and I, we get along, but then when zucchini goes crazy and I, now I got like 9,000 bushels of zucchini (laughs) and all the little thorns, those, who knew zucchini and cucumbers were actually painful? I did not know this. When they were at just a Whole Foods, I did not know that I could get <laughs> wounded by a vegetable, but there I am. Okay, so what are you guys growing? Come on, give me, give me the facts here. I'm growing both tomatoes <laughs> and cucumbers. There's this gorgeous, cute little variety of bonnie plants. It's called the Boston Pickling Cucumber. They're just little babies, and oh my you can just do a refrigerator pickle at home. They're adorable. You always gotta you gotta grow to the cuisine. You have to grow to what you mm. like to cook, right? And so I love to cook Italian and I love to cook um, like Mexican. And so you got I a lot of basil. To, You're like what? three in an oregano zone. <laughs> like you got a yeah. whole like yeah herb yeah. era going on in the backyard. Yeah, but only plant what you're going to be excited to cook with. Otherwise, you're just that person that's shoving cucumbers on your neighbors and (laughs) saying, please, will you take this? Or... (laughs) Yeah. I'm not going to lie. That was me. I was like, I think I can grow bell peppers. I don't like bell peppers. Yeah. (laughs) So, like, I like them in one place, and that's a pizza, and that's it. Like, I don't... And I only like one color. So, it was just like... (laughs) This is not, yeah. this is not good. I should not be doing this. So everyone got bell peppers. Like I apologize now to everyone who got a bell pepper, but yeah. So, and then uh, inside plant, is it like, is there like a favorite indoor? Like, do you guys have any indoor plant like preferences or anything that you're telling us all go like, Hey, y'all go out and get this. Like yeah, I'm part I'm- of little fiddle fig. I'm more of that indoor girly. Jess, Jess takes care of the outdoors. She gets the basil. She makes me pesto. It's perfect. Love. I'm more of the indoor plant girly where you, unfortunately, you can't see any, but I'm a big round. They need to be by the window. Hey, Liz, I know. Like they're, right, they're right in front of all the windows, but none behind me. Um, I love a good round tail snake plant. Let's see if I can drag her over real quick. I have one that is thriving. Yes. Absolutely. Look at that guy. Yes, I'm a big round tail snake or just normal steak. I don't discriminate. Um, I, love them all. I'm They're there great. with you. I got this yeah. little guy because I read an article that sent me down a rat hole to a NASA study that showed how many allergen particulates this little guy can pull yeah. out of my air. And I'm like, yep. every room will have one. I yep. like they're everywhere in our house. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And they're also the, the easiest. So I'll take it. I love it. I love it. Oh my God. Thank you guys. Thank you guys so much. Uh, so many best practices, so many great stories. Congratulations on all the stuff you guys are doing. Thank you. This is a great fun. I'm going to pause there because that's where our editor is going to go hack up the first 28 minutes of our conversation. I'm going to ask you guys a couple more questions. If you still have a little bit more time here Um, and I'm sorry, I think we may be going over. So I do apologize. If you guys have to run, I totally understand. And I'm happy to send these over to you written, but if you don't mind, I'm going to ask just a couple more of these that Larry has sent over for the customer insights. That be okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think a bit over, not terribly far over, but a bit. Yeah, I'm just going to ask you a couple of these important ones. And then maybe if there's a couple that Larry's like, no, I really need this. We might just email them back to you. But I think that the other stuff is awesome. When it comes to metrics and how the team is being measured, how your kind of success as a group is being measured, what are your find? What are you finding 
uh, that those business metrics for CX and for UX are? And how is that getting rolled up into other kind of business driving metrics? Yeah, engagement is often what we're reporting on and also brand perception and overall brand health. Oh, nice. Um, okay. We've got um, partners and siblings and cousins in our departments and organizations that are uh, a part of email marketing, social media. And so all of those those channels are coming together to really drive like a personal relationship and engagement um, awesome. with our consumers. Awesome. Love that. Love that. Um, so this is how, what proves that Larry listens to all the calls. Cause here's the question has when, uh, what's interesting about Scott's is how CX directly aligns with the broader corporate strategy. Uh, your CEO and the company's latest conference call cited market share gains and unit point of sale growth. How do you see your digital properties in terms of that direct sale, but also how do your properties aid that in-store buying process. Because again, for a lot of organizations, they're run by two separate teams, but mm -hmm. the insight that feeds the experience also comes from two separate teams. You guys seem very aligned across all of that. Yeah, and I think when it comes to our websites, it kind of goes back to education and content. So if you are searching for something and you're in that aisle on what grass seeds should I use or what fertilizer should I put down now and we intercept you on our own site, will educate the hell out of you, give you all the resources you need. And I don't care if you purchase from us or if we push you over to Home Depot or Lowe's yeah. or Ace to go buy on their websites or to go to their retail stores, it doesn't matter. And so I think that's really where we intercept and we grab them and build the confidence, educate as much as we can. And if you yeah. purchase from us, great. And if you go to somewhere else, that's also fine as well. So I like that confidence seems to be a major currency for the that experience strategy for you guys that it's you know how are we making that exchange of content for confidence and everyone can kind of bring that back into that virtuous cycle i, I really like that that's really well thought out mm -hmm. um okay so larry would like to know if you can share uh how are those efforts to drive direct to consumer how's that going um and what are some of the lessons maybe that you guys have learned through whether it's user testing, whether it is through some of the other ways that you are testing and driving metrics. Um, from that UX perspective, how are things going and, and where, where are you guys pushing and heading, let's say in the next year? Yeah, direct to consumer, I think is so, so interesting. There are certain products for which direct to consumer, either through our own website or through our retailers' websites, um, it feels so natural and such a wonderful fit. There are others where we have to do a little bit of educating on like, yeah, this is something you can totally get it shipped to your house. And in fact, do you want to subscribe to it? And we'll just send it to you every three months so you don't have mm. to worry about it. Um, so when you need to repot that plant <laughs> and um, keep it from, you know, growing exactly. too far. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the, we can help make that really seamless and easy yeah. for you. Um, but I think that also we're... Um, we're helping drive to retailers in really smart ways, helping, like Haley mentioned, intercepting folks and pushing them to retailers that are a good mm -hmm. fit for them. And even if they've come to our site saying, hey, you have a great store that's just down the road that can deliver this for you. Yeah, well, you can do it today. <laughs> it up curbside. I think that yeah. curbside and, um, you know, some of those buy online, pick up in store kinds of solutions okay. that are available are a really, really great match for our category. And um, with certain retailers being able to just add on those gardening supplies when you get your grocery order or when you're there to pick up the diapers and everything else that you need at the store, that just taking care of the weekend's projects and getting yeah. everything you need all in one stop is a really great way for us to sort of show up for them. So making it really convenient, making it yeah. easy and giving that perception of ease um, when taking on those projects, I think is is good. But nice. yeah, growth in direct to consumer is um, it's going well. I think that we're really leaning in. We have a really amazing omni channel and shopper marketing teams that are doing amazing things with some of these retailers and pushing the boundaries on a lot of stuff.